Hello, and welcome to Lecture 8 of, uh, of Semantics. So in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to st see how we can formulate recursive definitions in, uh, in, our, in our simple language. So L2 is going to grow recursive functions. And so as a first step, what we're going to do is we're going to look at local definitions. So, so, so far in, L, uh, in L2, we have assignment, dereference, sequencing, looping, conditionals as the sort of imperative core of the language. And then to support functions, what we did was we added lambda abstractions, applications, and variables. And if you look at a program that you've written in a language like, uh, I don't know, Camel or Java or something like this, you'll see that you do indeed get variables from the function parameters of a function, but you also get the var put variables in scope with local definitions. And so what we'll do first is we will see how we can add local definitions to L2. And it turns out to actually be extremely e easy. So what we're going to do is we're going to extend our grammar with a form that says let val x colon t is equal to e1 in e2. And so what this means is we're, we want to take the value of the expression e1, bind it to the variable x, and then evaluate e2. And so the idea is that we can regard this purely as syntactic sugar. So if you see this expression here, let x equals e1 and e2, that has the same effect as introducing a lambda abstraction, fn x colon t goes to e2, and then immediately evaluate, and then immediately giving it the argument e1. And so the, uh, the way that we want to think about this is that if you think about the the derived typing introduction rules for this. So if we're thinking about let val as a, as a sort of macro, then if you look at the typing rules, you'll see, okay, well, we want E1 to have the type T and we want X to have the type uh, T and E2 to have the type T prime. And this typing rule for let comes from expanding this definition. So let's actually take a look at that. So what we've got here is we have we want to say that let val xt t prime so this is the uh, this is the the expression that we want to have a typing rule for and the way that we can derive that typing rule is we can say well this let let expression is really going to be a function application. So fn x colon t goes to e2 applied to e1. So let's set this aside and now let's take a look at this. Uh, let's take a look at this and see what rules we can apply. So the since this is an application we can turn to the uh, app rule for our typing and what we'll see is we have two, two more things we need to derive. We need to derive a type for fn xt goes to e2 and this needs to be t to t prime let me make this a little longer and then what we need is we need to show that uh, e1 has the type t and now we're not quite done here so what we need to show now is we can apply the function rule and that will tell us that we can type check a function in an extended context. And now what we can do is we can say, okay, we have this premise and this premise up here. So if we look at the leaves of this tree, we're going to find that this, uh, that this application expression has two subderivations. It has one for E2 and one for E1. And so if we just copy these down, then what we will find is that we have the typing rule for let bindings. And so this is going to be our typing rule for let. 
and you can see how the typing for E1 sort of ari arises as a, uh, a, a, sub, a sub derivation of the typing derivation for this application. And so we're able to get a typing rule for let's from thinking about how you could encode it using, using functions and arguments. And so that's how the typing rule for, uh, for let binding works. And in fact, even the, uh, even the operational semantics for, uh, for let bindings works the same way. So the two, uh, the two rules that we have say, if you see a let expression, what you want to do first is if you see let x equals e1 and e2, first you evaluate e1. So if e1 goes to e1 prime, then let x equals e1 and e2 will go to let x equals e1 prime in e2. So we're evaluating the thing that we're going to bind first. And then once it's a value, what we're going to do is we're going to, if you see let x equals v in e2, we can actually just go ahead and do the substitution. And you can see again that both of these rules, the, the let one and the let rule, can be derived from the operational semantics rules for, uh, for applications. So if you we have fnxt goes to e2, e1, then in some, in some state s, then the reduction rule for it, so this is going to be the app1 rule. The app1 rule will say, okay, if e2s goes to e2 prime s prime, then this whole expression here will go to uh, sorry e1 prime. These should all be e1s. Okay. So now what we've got. Okay, so now the app1 rule tells us that when we see fn x colon t goes to e2 with e1 applied to it, that goes to fn x goes to e2 with e1 prime applied to it when e1 goes to e1 prime. And that's just the uh, congruence rule for applications. And likewise, the rule for, uh, for applications What this is going to do is it's going to actually just do the substitution. So the 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 actual the reduction rule for uh, for function application says when the argument is a value, do the application, and this thing here corresponds to the let two rule, and the congruence rule for functions corresponds to the uh, corresponds to the function uh, to the to the let congruence rule, and so both of the operational semantics rules can also be derived from this uh, from this macro process. So let bindings um, have natural typing introduction rules, and they're exactly the same as what you would get from this uh, from this encoding, and. Uh, just as an aside, like this encoding isn't entirely a technical trick. Um, for a long time, uh, JavaScript did not have uh, did not have lexical scoping of variables, and so whenever you so when you you declared variables with var and those were scoped globally through the whole function. And so when you want whenever you wanted to properly introduce a new scope people would actually write, write an expression that looked exactly like this one. Um, luckily in about, I think 2015 or so, um, JavaScript was extended with the let and const operators, which actually do introduce a new scope. And so we no longer need to do this. Um, but for a surprisingly long time, uh, um, you, would, you, would see, you would see this kind of thing in actual code. Okay, and so now, Let's go, let's go to recursive definitions. And so here is a function that we want to uh, 
we want to implement uh, recursively. And so what we want to do is we want to define a function x and it ta uh, this function x takes an ar argument y and what it'll do is it'll say okay if y is greater than 1, if its argument is greater than 1, uh, return y plus uh, the recursive function x um, applied to y minus 1 else 0. So this is really just adding up all the numbers that run from uh, um, whatever the argument is down to zero. So let's uh, let's actually write this as a OCaml function. So this is this is sort of the function we want to to write. I'll call it yeah. I'll call it f rather than uh, than y. So we'll say okay, if y is greater than or equal greater than zero, then is it greater? Oh, greater than or equal to one, then we return f of y minus one, y plus. Otherwise, what we want to do is we want to return zero. And so now, if we call this function, let's say on ten what we're going to get is 55, which is the sum of the numbers from uh, from 0 to 10. Okay, so that's what this function does. But how can it, but you can note that what it's doing is it's using x within the definition of x. So if you look right here, we have an f, and it gets used inside of the function as well. Okay, so now when we, so the thing that we want to do when we evaluate this, uh, this definition is we want to replace every recursive occurrence of x with itself as we evaluate along. And so what you can see here is what one thing you, you could immediately try is you can say, okay, well, we're going to introduce a recursive binding that says let val rex x colon t is equal to e in e prime. And then the idea is that we want at function type to say, okay, this is going to be a bind it to a recursive function, and then when you evaluate x3, x applied to 3, we have the recursive function in scope. Okay, and now uh, this, this seems to work for this expression, um, but we run into like certain difficulties with this idea of, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to allow recursive bindings that allow the variable to occur inside of the expression. And the problem is that sometimes we're going to have, um, you know, sort of strange expressions like this. So if you say let x equals x comma x, um, what is that thing? Like, does, does that, does that, can that even make sense? Um, and you know, here's another here's another w weird thing. Um, we have a list of integers, and it's equal to three const on two itself. Um, now you can ask, should that terminate? Should it should it go into an infinite loop? Should it make a self-referential data structure? Um, and if it is a self-referential data structure, like how do we do equality? Should three const onto x be the same as equal test for equality as three const onto three const onto x? Because after all, if we implement this um, as a pointer structure, we'll have a, a cons cell with a three in the head and an x pointing back to the original. And here we'll have two, so they'll be physically set different objects. So should they be equal? And if so, how should we compare them for equality? And so, in a call by name language like Haskell, a call by need language like Haskell, this, these kinds of definitions are actually allowed um, because call by name only evaluates as much as is needed. And so an expression like this one is, is, a, is a computation that gives you an infinite sequence of threes. And, you, and as you explore the list, you'll incrementally generate more and more threes. Um, in a call by language, in a call by value language, though, we usually want to disallow these definitions. Um, we only want to allow recursive definitions at functions because we would sort of exp expect expressions like this to go into an infinite loop. Um, and so the idea that we want to do is um, introduce this idea of a let val rec, a recursive value binding, to function types. So we're going to say uh, 
that we're going to have a recursive binding of values that is restricted to function types and the thing that you bind is only a function value. So what we want to do is we want to say um, that we're, we're going to extend the grammar with let val rec f equals this function body in in the context that actually uses that recursive definition. And so what we want is we're going to say, okay, when we type check this function expression, what we want to do is we want to put the argument y at type t1 into scope for the body e1, but we also want the variable x, the recursively bound variable to be in scope. So this expression right here is a recursively defined function, which has the, the type for the function name and it also has a binding for the argument and that's in scope for e1 and then in e2 what we're going to do is we're going to just put the function that we've defined at type t1 arrow t2 into scope and so in ml so i wrote this definition in ocaml and you can actually write it like this just as well fun y goes to if x equals and this is a this is a perfectly fine definition as far as the OCaml compiler is concerned. So we're defining the recursive variable f, and we want um, f n y goes to the body of the function to be in scope. And if we tried to define other things recursively, so if we tried to define x like this, it will it will give us a type error. And you know, if we tried to define something like, uh, you know, three, uh, what should we do? Like, let's say list dot map fn plus one of x. So if we want to generate a sequence of uh, of numbers that goes up, it'll it'll say no, this is not allowed because this is not a this is not a value expression. And so these are the kinds of things that correspond to the restrictions here. We're defining a recursive function, and so the restrictions are we're, when we're defining our recursive function, the function has to have a function type, and the body of a, fun a recursive function actually has to be a function value. And so now, after so so the thing to notice is that two things are going on in this typing rule. So this part, the let val rec equal of x equals uh, fn y goes to e1 that's defining a recursive function and then the e2 is the thing which actually uses it and um, annoyingly this is a somewhat composite construct and this makes the uh, operational semantics of this rule a bit more complicated than you would like so if you see a recursive function definition, what you have to do is you have to say, okay, what, I, what you want to do is you want to say, okay, I want to, when you see a let binding, you want to substitute the thing that was bound in for x inside of e2 and then evaluate e2. Um, but how do, we, how do we keep this recursive x in scope? And the, the, the trick that we have to do is we have to say that... Um, we are going to return a function which binds the recursive uh, definition inside the scope of the body um, when we when we unroll uh, when we unroll e2, and so this rule is uh, is quite complicated. And every time I've lectured it, people have struggled with it. So the thing I want to do is I want to explain how it arises from smaller pieces. So. So here, um, what we've got is, so now let's think about what would happen if we wanted to just have an operator that gave, took, a, took a function and gave us back a, uh, a recursive definition. So if we just wanted, let me even make this a bit bigger. Okay, so now suppose we, we defined a, a, a 
recursive function. So let's say fun x equals t, and we want it to have the type t1 to t2. Okay, how so? So this is a value, which is a recursive function, and this f is the name of the recursive function inside of the body E, and the x is the argument. So we, let's even write it in a more suggestive way, way like this. And so what we, want, what we can do is we can say, okay, we're defining a recursive function of type t1 arrow t2. So what we can do, in fact, let's even put in the type annotation so it's clear what the type of everything is. And then the whole expression, the result, should have the type t2. So now the way that we can type check this is we can say, okay, we want f to have the type t1 to t2 and x is the argument and it should have the type t1. And now what we can do is we want to check that the body has the type t2. Oh, and so this is uh, the typing for a recursive function value. So let's extend our values here too. So this is our, our new language of values. And now what we can do is we can add a reduction rule for this. So let's call this app rec. And so now what we'll do is we'll say, okay, if you are applying a recursive function to a value, then the thing that we want to do is we have this value and we want to substitute it into the body of E. So we want to substitute it for X. But the body E has two free variables. It has the free variable X, which we can substitute with V, and it also has the, recurs the recursive function variable, the self-reference F. And so what we can do is we can do two substitutions. We can say we want the, the recursive function variable to refer to the function itself. And we want to substitute this for f, and we want to substitute v for x. And we want to put both of those into the body e. So what we're doing is we're actually, let me write it like this, so that we are substituting two variables. We're replacing the, the, uh, the function variable f that's occurring in E with the recursive function itself. So this whole function is, is being replaced for f, and then we're replacing the argument v uh, for all the, in all the occurrences x inside the body of E. And so this way, it's sort of more visible how the, uh, how the recursive definition is getting unrolled recursively. And you can see how the uh, F gets replaced inside of the body over and over again. So it's literally the same self-referential thing. And then in order to implement the let val rec thing, so let val rec, uh, we called it F T1, to t2 is equal to fn y of type t1. So the way that we type checked this, what we can think of this as is this is a macro, macro definition of where we do let val non-recursively And now we can use the recursive definition. Let me put in some more parentheses to make it all clear. <laughs> 
So now you can see that when you define a recursive function in a language like OCaml, what's actually happening is two things are being defined. First, we're defining a recursive function. And then we're binding the result of that recursive definition to a variable that get, becomes visible inside of the scope E2. And so if we present this construct as a single construction, we end up with a more complicated typing rule. And so what we see here is that uh, um, when we give the reduction rule for it, what we, we're trying to do two things at once. We're trying to substitute uh, the recursive definition inside of E2. And in order to get that to work, we have to substitute a function value and we have to expand the function, this, uh, this recursive definition into a lambda abstraction that binds the recursive definition and then uses E1 and introduces a variable Y for the, uh, for the body as well. And so we're doing a little bit of, we're doing a complicated little dance in order to get the self-reference to work out properly. And this is something that you'll see quite often, like uh, when you're building when you're building semantics for programming languages. Something that happens with uh, you know regular frequency is that there will be some construction which is you know it's sort of the natural one for a programmer to use, but it'll turn out that its semantics is very complicated. And the reason that it's complicated is that it's actually combining the effects of uh, of several different operations, and so. What, what ends up happening is that the semantic rule you need to write has to simulate the effect of several di several different uh, several different constructs and so the the uh, the so, uh, operational semantics will be pretty complicated but on the other hand if you have the freedom to decompose the, that more complicated feature into several less complicated features then the semantics gets much easier to represent because each thing does only one each each uh, each construct only does one thing. And now when you're doing language design for languages that are pe that people actually use, um, often you don't have the freedom to just break and decompose every construct into its primitives because that would that would change the grammar and break backwards compatibility for programs, say. And so in that case, a reasonable thing to do is actually to do the desugaring as part of the compiler pipeline. So you take your surface language, which has the sort of programmer natural or program, programmer expected grammar, and you translate it into a core language or intermediate representation for your compiler, which is more orthogonal and regular. And then if you do that, you can give the semantics of the surface language by translation. And you'll know that your surface language features will have a sensible semantics if all the parts that they translate into have a, have a reasonable semantics. Okay, and so now here you can see a, uh, an example of a minimization routine, which is going to uh, be a higher order function. So it's going to, uh, xfn is going to find the smallest n prime bigger than the argument n for which f of n prime evaluates to some, some number smaller than z uh, zero. And so what we're doing here is we're defining a recursive function and this recursive function takes a function as an argument and it takes a integer as an argument and what it does is it says well if f of z is bigger than one then this is not the number that we want so we'll call the function recursively and try the next bigger number and if it is zero or less then we return zero okay and so now once once we've defined this x what we can do is we can take that function we returned we defined before this f which, uh, oh no, this is not the one we defined before. This, we're going to apply it to a certain f, and the f we're going to apply it to is a function which takes an argument, and if the argument is bigger than three, um, then if, uh, uh, and, and if the argument is less than three, so if it's in the range, uh, oh no, if it's exactly equal to three, then we return zero, otherwise we return one. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to initialize it with zero. And let's see what, what happens here. So let's define our recursive function. 
And so now we're going to define our function let f x let rec f x f equal f n. And so what we want to do is we're going to say, oh, we wrote z here. If z is uh, if f of z is greater than or equal to one, then we want to return x f z plus one. Otherwise, we return z. And so now we have our function int to int to int to int. And so next, what we can do is we can define this f here. So oh, f of z again. And it's going to be if z is greater than or equal to 3, then if z 3 is greater than or equal to z, then 0 else 1. So this is going to be 1 everywhere except for 3. And so now we can call xf with 0, and we get 3. So it's making all these recursive calls the way that we expect, even with higher order functions in, in, the, in play. OK. And so this idea of syntactic sugar um, is one that will come up over and over again. Um, so, for in, for instance, we introduce sequencing at the uh, at the beginning of the language at the beginning of the of the course, and what we did was we said, okay, evaluate e one first, and then evaluate e two, and so now now that we have functions, we can encode sequencing using it as well. So e one semicolon e two can be encoded as um, make e two into a function, which takes a unit argument, and then it gets past E1. So E1 will evaluate to a unit, it'll pass it to a Y, which is not in scope for E2, and so then we'll evaluate E2. Okay, and likewise, while loops can also be encoded using, uh, using recursive definitions now that we have functions in recursion. So, you know, we implemented while E1 do E2 as evaluate E1, and if it's true, um, evaluate e2 and then re rerun the uh, recursive loop. And so what we can do to encode a loop e while e1 do e2 is we can define a recursive function of type unit to unit and then um, what we can do is we can say if the test condition is true then evaluate e2 and then recursively call the while loop. And otherwise, we return unit. And then once we have this recursive definition, we just kick it off with a skip. And so in order to make this work, we just introduce w and y, which are variables that don't occur in e1 and d2. And so now this while loop can be encoded using, uh, using uh, just recursion. So again, let's take a little look at this. So suppose that. Uh, you know, let's let's uh, introduce two variables here. So let's say n is ref five, let x be ref zero, and so now we can say while uh, n is greater than zero, do r gets set to uh, let's say the contents of r plus the contents of n. And then let's uh, set n to the contents of n minus 1. Oh, it was. Uh, so now let's execute this. And now let's look at the let, let's look at our, our, our results. And so we had the contents 15. OK, and so this just added up the numbers from 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0 by looking at n and uh, r. OK, so now let's reinitialize r and n. So let's set r to be 0. Let's set n to be 5. And now let's define a, a while loop. Let rec while. And what we will do is we'll say if n is greater than 0, then what we want to do is we want to set r to be bang r plus bang n, and we want to set n 
and we want to set n to the contents of n minus 1. And otherwise, what we want to do is we want to, oh, yes, and then we want to call our while recurse on our while loop. And now what we'll do is we'll return skip. Oh, yes, while is a keyword. So let's call it while prime. What is going on here? Okay, so now what we've got is let's run while prime. And now let's look at the contents of R and 15 just as before. So our, our encoding for while loops works. Or it works in this case. Um, we'll need to, we would need to do a proof to show that this uh, syntactic sugar encoding works in general, but it's not a, it's not a very difficult one. Okay, so now um, you can ask, okay, well, with functions and recursion, we can encode a whole host of features, but can we go the other way around? Um, if, can we encode recursion um, in, in the lambda calculus? And it turns out that the answer is no, because we had it, we, we, I, we asserted a normalization theorem in the last lecture where we said, if we don't use while or store, then every program terminates. And with the while loop, you can write programs that, uh, that run forever. And likewise with recursion, you can write programs that run forever. In fact, it's not very difficult even. So this is a function that just immediately calls itself. And when you do that, it just sits and spins. Um, all I'm doing is I'm converting electricity to heat here. Okay, so now we know that recursion in some sense is essential. We can't do without it, um, regardless of whether we uh, implement it with while loops or with, uh, with uh, function calls. And um, I should add that this is a this is a distinction that ends up being one without a difference. So uh, when you take the advanced compilers class, you'll learn about something called SSA form, and um, essentially this is an intermediate representation for a compiler where all imperative control flow is converted to a functional form um, as a prelude to generating machine code. Um, so. Pretty much uh, all modern compilers use an SSA representation, and so uh, you know the choice of whether your surface language has uh, has recursive functions or while loops is pretty much just a matter of taste for a language designer. Okay, so now that we've talked a bit about uh, implementing uh, about uh, about how you can not implementing, but how about how we represent recursion in the source language along with its typing and reduction rules, the question is, how might we implement this? And there is an implementation of L2 on the course webpage. It's in standard ML, and uh, um, there's two, two files you should look at especially, syntax.sml and semantics.sml. And this uses a front end that was written with Moscow ML and Mos Moscow ML Yak. Okay, and so now, there's a series, a, a series of implementation choices that we have to make. So now, how do we implement scope resolution? And we introduced functions, and then we introduced recursive functions. And so now the question is, how can we represent uh, variables and their scoping? And so we saw in the uh, in the previous uh, previous two lectures that. We started out with variable names that were represented as strings, and then we talked a bit about how all alpha equivalent representations could be uh, could be converted to a uniform representation using de Brown indices. And so, de Brown index is basically just an offset saying um, a pointer back to the original binding site at each variable reference. And it, you can implement this by counting the number of scopes that you cross on the way to your original binder. 
And so our surface language has variables represented as strings, but our internal representation can use de Brown indices. And so the variable just becomes an integer, and functions don't need to bind a formal parameter anymore, because whenever you see a, 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 an fn expression, you know for sure that what's going to have that a variable is being bound here, and there's just going to be a number referencing referencing this location. And so the uh, the internal uh, the internal representation is just going to uh, have the type of the argument along with the body of the function, and we don't need a string representing the formal parameter. And so then we can run a scope resolution function, which will take a raw expression with string names and produce an expression with these integer offsets. And so um, the the uh, way that we implement substitution um, is actually pretty cute. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a substitution function which takes a, 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 an expression, a variable position, which is a number, not a string anymore, and a body to substitute into. And it returns a new expression that's the result of doing the substitution. And so the way that this works is we've replaced every variable with, with, uh, with its pointer back to the binding site. And so what we can do is we can say substitute e0 e prime is going to substitute e for the outermost variable in e prime. And so as you climb the scope stack, you, you want to substitute more and more the uh, the uh, uh, you'll you'll want to you'll want to increment this number, um, and the uh, and you'll you'll increment this uh, this counter each time you uh, you you cross a binding, um, and I'm going to give a slightly specialized definition here for substituting values, so closed values, um, and. Um, that's the, and if you remember, when you substitute open expressions for variables, you have to do a dance with alpha renaming. Um, and I'm just going to skip over that in this uh, in this part of the lecture. And you can look at the Pierce book for like sort of the full definition. And so now, what you can do is you can say, all right, when I perform a substitution of e n for a variable. We know that the uh, the occurrences match when the number n1 meets, meets is the same as the number that we want to substitute. And so what we'll do is we'll say, OK, if n is equal to n1, we, then we replace it with e. Otherwise, we just return var n1. So we don't do anything if it's the wrong variable. And if it's the right variable, we replace it with e. And then for cases like applications, it's just a structural recursion. We want to substitute e for n, e for the variable occurrence n in e1, e applied to e2, and so we just substitute it in, in e1 and we substitute into e2. Interesting things happen when there are binders. And so when we want to substitute e for uh, n inside a function, what we want to do is we want to return a function and we want to substitute inside the body e1. But the thing that we have to do is we have to increment uh, n by 1. And the reason is that inside of e1, 0 is going to refer to the formal parameter of the function, and all of the other numbers get need to be increased by 1 to compensate. So we've gone inside the scope, so the number that we need to increment goes up by 1. And so, as a so a, another way of thinking of seeing this is that if you have an expression like x uh, f n y goes to x plus y, then when we debrownify it, what we'll get is the X can be, uh, actually, let me, let me even make this a zero, fnx. So when we have an expression like this, um, this variable, uh, we're going to introduce numbers for x and y. And so this will become fn int 
goes to var zero because we want to point from x back to the original binding site. And then when we see the fn, let's see. Now, what we want to do is we want uh, we want to replace the, the the symbolic names x and y with with numbers, and so the question is which number should we use, and so the answer is that y the variable should refer to the inner to it should be a pointer to the enclosing scope, and so y points to the innermost enclosing scope, so it's going to become a zero. And x is not pointing to y, it's pointing to 1. So we have to cross one binder, this binder for y, to reach the x. And so this is going to become var 1. And so the same variable x is var 0 over here and var 1 over here. And so what we need to do whenever we cross a binding site is we need to increment the number here. So they, instead of substituting uh, e for occurrence n, we're going to substitute e for occurrence n plus 1 because there's one more variable in scope at this position. And you can see this go on with the let binding as well. So here when we do a let binding, uh, we're binding e1 to a variable that's in scope for e2. And so when we do the substitution, we do subst e n e1 because there are no new variables in e1, but because what the result of e1 is bound in e2, we have to bump the counter by one here when we go into the into the into the body of e2. And so um, and so for recursive functions, it's it's even a little bit more complicated because we, the recursive definition binds two variables. So you have to you have to do you have to increment the counter twice here. Okay, so now when you implement reduction, what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, if we are at a, if we are we're applying a function, and if e1 is a value, a function, then what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, and if the second argument e2 the is also a value, we just do a substitution and we substitute zero here. And one thing that happens is when you try to go from an abstract machine to something more like machine code, like bytecode or something, um, all of these substitutions get can get turned into operations on the argument stack. So this number you can think of as a as a as a stack offset. Okay, so that's how the implementation of the of the uh, of the reductions works and how we change sub how we implement substitution we also need to implement type inference and the changes here are are a, a little less substantial so we talked about how gamma is now a pair of mappings one mapping locations to variable locations to their types and the other mapping variables to their types and so here our type environment is just a list of number of a types. And so what happened? So I said, oh, we need to map variables to their types, but I don't see any variables in this second component. So we have the pair as we expected, but the second component isn't quite what we expected. And the reason is that once you put things into de Brown form, you don't need the variable names anymore because we're just going to refer to variables by a number. And the same goes for variables in the context. We can just maintain a list of variables, and whenever we refer to a variable, we can refer to the nth index of this list. And so when we're inferring the type for a variable, what we can do is we can say, OK, sharp 2 gamma gets us the second component of this list, which is the list of type expressions, and then we're getting the nth variable, so we'll just do we'll just do list dot nth on the on that list of expressions to find the nth element of the list. And when we're doing type uh, type inference for functions, what we can do is we can say we're going to infer a type for e, and we're going to just cons the type onto this list. So we're putting the type onto the list of, of, uh, of types for the, for the, for the variables. And then 
if we infer a t successfully infer a type for t prime for the body, we can return a function type t to t prime for this whole function expression. And so, um, so we're able using the de Brown representation to avoid having to um, re uh, put variables into our into our uh, into our representation. And so, one thing you might notice is that implementing substitution naively is quite expensive. So if we look at this implementation of substitution, you can see that when you replace a, when you do, when you do a substitution of uh, E into a body, you have to do a recursive traversal of the whole program to find all of the possible variable sites. And this is, in general, you know, an O of N uh, operation. It's linear in the size of the uh, of the of the program and so this is slow um, and so these kinds of tree interpreters are not uh, uh, are not a, are not a great implementation and then uh, if you take when you take compiler uh, construction you'll see that you there's more uh, more efficient implementations such as closures um, and these make these make doing variable lookups much faster, and they they do the substitution lazily and go from linear to basically constant time. Um, and so one thing we could do in this course, uh, but we're not going to, is you can we could give another abstract semantic abstract machine that's a bit closer to an implementation, and then once you have these two two semantics, you could prove that the second corresponds to the original. And as long as you don't screw it up, you can have uh, you can have multiple operational semantics for the same language. Um, there's a, this is actually a common technique in uh, in when you're when you're proving the correctness of uh, of com various compiler uh, optimizations. Um, in fact, there's a number of machine checked compilers like the CompCert compiler for C. Um, where the entire lang where the entire compiler is specified as a sequence of abstract machines, and the compilation pipeline translates from uh, programs in one representation to the next intermediate representation, and at each stage you prove that the compilation um, corresponds to the previous one. And so, starting from the topmost semantics, you end up with a semantics that's very close to assembly. And so that way, you're able to prove that the compiler actually preserves the semantics of the source program. OK. And so one, one final aside before I wrap up for today. Um, so throughout this course, we've been using what are called small step semantics. We say this expression E takes one step of evaluation to an expression E prime. And so when you when you look on the internet, you'll note that you'll find out that there's an alternative style of semantics called big step semantics, which goes straight from an expression to a value. So if you so for for example, if you wanted to give a evaluation rule for addition, you might say, well, if e1 evaluates to a number n and e2 evaluates to a number n2, then e1 plus e2 will evaluate to the sum of those two numbers. And so um, the difference between these two uh, styles of semantics, um, it's a matter of taste for sequential languages. Um, and when it comes to concurrency, it turns out that small step semantics is actually substantially more convenient because it makes it easier for you to talk about the uh, interleaving that occurs in concurrent programs. Um, but for big step semantics, uh, for sequential programs, it doesn't make much of a difference. The only, the only place it might make a difference is that big step semantics is closer to how you might implement a naive interpreter for a programming language. Okay, and in the next lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about adding data types to, to our programming language, and that will take us from L2 to L3. So thank you very much.